What's up, everybody? I'm Finn McKenty. This is the Punk Rock NBA, and today we are here to answer a very simple question. Who are the heaviest bands on earth? But even though it is a simple question, the answer is not. Is the heaviest band the fastest one? The slowest band? Is it the band with the most breakdowns that hit the hardest? Or is it the band with the craziest vocals, the sickest lyrics? Or is it actually heavier to use more contrast and melody in your music? Is it possible that Alice in Chains and Nirvana are actually heavier than Infant Annihilator? I will answer all those questions and more in this video and also give you a list of some extremely heavy bands to check out if that is something you're looking for. So stay tuned for that and also check me out on Twitch if if you haven't, I'm streaming twice a week from 4 to 7 p.m. Pacific on Tuesdays and Thursdays. There's a link to that in the description of this video. But first, I want to thank Harry's for sponsoring this video. Have you looked in the mirror lately? Like really, really looked? That beard you grew out last year when you started listening to Deftones, well, it was cool. But you really need to tame that bad boy, and Harry's is here to help. Harry's crafts high-quality, long-lasting blades and durable weighted handles that make a close, comfortable shave quick and, dare I say, even enjoyable. And because Harry's insists that you shouldn't have to choose between a great shave and a fair price, they just give you both. Like, refill blades start as low as $2. Easy decision, right? And what's even easier, new Harry's customers get their starter set, which includes a five blade razor with this weighted handle, very nice, this foaming shave gel with aloe, and a travel cover. It's over a $13 value, all for $3. So there has never been a better time to try Harry's. Go to harrys.com slash punk to get their starter set for just three bucks. And it is 100% satisfaction guaranteed, so you have nothing to lose. Go to harrys.com com slash punk right now to get this special offer. That's harrys.com slash punk. So I think the first and probably most obvious conception of heavy is extreme because this is kind of a natural line of thinking, right? Like for me, the first metal band I ever got into was Suicidal Tendencies. Then I discovered Sepultura, then Carcass, and Napalm Death, and Morbid Angel, all that earache stuff. And then pretty much spent the next decade trying to find the sickest, most over-the-top death metal bands that I could. And as far as that goes, the first thing that I would point to is Tomb of the Mutilated by Cannibal Corpse, which really like single-handedly set a new high bar for brutality back in 1992 when it came out. And look, Chris Barnes may be washed up now. You can think what you want about Six Feet Under. But this album was absolutely insane back in the day and in my opinion, still holds up. To me, that's really the one album that kind of put brutal death metal on the map for a larger audience. And since then, the kind of arms race of brutality has kind of like escalated every couple years. Another big one for me was Disgorge back in 1998, which took that cannibal style to a new level. as well as bands like Dying Fetus and Nile, who continue to push death metal to heavier and heavier extremes. But I think really the next big inflection point for, I guess, what you would call like brutal music was in the mid 2000s when Deathcore came around. By that point, in my opinion, and I was certainly not alone in this opinion, death metal had gotten kind of stale and overproduced, kind of predictable. It was just kind of repeating what had already been done 10 or 15 years earlier, which to me is not really heavy. And so even though I had been listening to death metal for over 10 years at this point, Deathcore came along and really just like kicked me in the balls with how heavy it was. Mostly because it felt just like raw and nasty in a way that death metal had kind of lost touch with and also added breakdowns to the mix, which added some dynamics and groove that had also kind of gotten lost in death metal with the race to see who could play the fastest tremolo picking riffs and blast beats all the time. As a couple examples of what I'm talking about, I would point to like early Whitechapel, which was maybe the perfect example of that style of deathcore as far as like brutal death metal with breakdowns added to the mix. <laughs> And of course, my personal favorite band in the genre, Suicide Silence, whose first album, The Cleansing, is to this day, one of the most just like insanely brutal, heavy, over the top things I have ever heard in my entire life.
just absolutely ridiculous and punishing and aggressive. And I think a big part of that is because it broke away from so many of these death metal traditions. For example, it was recorded live in the studio, meaning that the band showed up at the studio, set up the drums, the bass, guitars, the vocals, pressed record, and that is what you hear on the album, which is actually a very, very rare thing. For those who don't know, 99% of albums are recorded one instrument at a time, one part at a time, sometimes even a couple notes at a time, which allows them to fix all the quote unquote mistakes and get everything just perfect on the album, which on the one hand is fine. I understand that a band wants to get everything just right, especially in metal, which is all about like precision and being as tight as possible. But on the other hand, I think that mentality is a big part of why death metal had gotten too sterile and perfect. Like you compare that stuff with this album, which is just filthy and nasty with that kind of like aggression and energy that you can really only get from playing in the same room together at the same time. And you knew that the deathcore bands were doing something right because as you'll remember if you're around back then, the death metal nerds and elitists absolutely hated this stuff. And if you're offending death metal fans, well, that is a sign that you are pretty damn heavy, right? And deathcore has only continued in that direction over the last 15 years or so, with maybe the pinnacle of that combination of rawness, brutality, and just like over-the-top extremity being Infant Annihilator. <laughs> But listening to this stuff, it kind of raises the question, is being like over the top extreme in that way all there is to being heavy? And you know, to me, there's almost something that is not heavy about it, if that makes sense. Like the nonstop blasting and breakdowns and growling and gurgling and screaming, it almost stops being heavy at a certain point because it loses its impact. It's like eating a whole gallon of ice cream in one sitting, which you really see when you look at the bands who push extremity to the uh, extreme, I guess, to the point where it's like this close from being just pure noise. <laughs> And I really wouldn't call that heavy per se. It is kind of just noise. So with that in mind, let's look at a few other, maybe more nuanced definitions of what is heavy. The first thing that comes to mind for me is the bands whose music is based on groove with the most obvious example there being Pantera. And so on the one hand, you're like, Pantera, really? I mean, they're a cool band, but are they heavy? And yeah, on the one hand, they only tuned down half a step. They never played blast beats. They never did any like crazy deep Chris Barnes vocals. But on the other hand, is there anybody who would deny that this is just heavy as fuck? Or as maybe the more extreme version of that, Gojira who are sort of the halfway point between the old school death metal of Morbid Angel and the groove metal of Pantera or Machine Head. I think you could also include bands like Lamb of God or Amir here. And yeah, it's not the most extreme stuff, obviously, but still I think it's heavy because like it makes you wanna move, right? It inspires this emotional response and really even a physical response, whether that's moshing in a show or pushing yourself at a gym. Like there's something about this groove kind of music that makes you want to move, right? And to me, that is arguably heavier than some death metal band just blasting and growling for an entire album 45 minutes long. I mean, I love that stuff. I've been listening to death metal for 30 years, but it's just never going to make me feel pumped in the same way that a band that grooves super hard will. And I think that's got to count for something. Which brings us to that subset of bands who took the idea of that like slow grinding groove to its logical extreme and made that the whole basis of their music, almost like the opposite of grindcore. One example that comes to mind from back in the 90s is Crowbar. <gasps> And this stuff might not seem like super groundbreaking now because this sound has gotten so popular, but you have to look at it through the lens of the time. In an era where most bands were still tuning to E and trying to sound like Anthrax or Megadeth, they were like tuning way down to B and playing these slow, sludgy grooves. And it was just like insanely heavy by comparison to the thrash stuff. 
Again, this style is pretty popular now, but it was not back then. These guys were like so ahead of their time. The people didn't really catch up to them until like 15 or 20 years later. Crowbar is without a doubt more popular now than they were in 93. And of course, there's all the other bands like Sleep and Electric Wizard who took that in kind of more of like the stoner doom direction, which is really heavy in its own right. Or more recently, the Acacia Strain, whose 2010 album Wormwood is an absolute masterpiece that's kind of like the combination of Crowbar and Meshuggah, and it is as heavy as that sounds. Where you come from, broken And again, I kind of feel like this stuff is heavier than just pure speed and brutality and aggression because it really gives you room to feel and hear and digest every note because it's not just like flying past you at 250 beats per minute. There's a level of intentionality here that is really kind of impossible to achieve with music that has that many notes in it. And by now, you may be asking the question, okay, if fast is heavy and slow is heavy, well, what if you put them together? Wouldn't that be like twice as heavy? And the answer, at least in my opinion, is yes. <laughs> yes, it would be. One of the best examples of this to me would be Suffocation. Easily my favorite 90s death metal band. And their whole style is kind of based on going from blast beats to like really chunky, slamming groove parts on a dime, almost like a machine shifting gears. Or on the more modern side of things, there's kind of like this new sub sub genre that I think you could put under this category, which people are calling Thal. I don't actually know where that name came from, but it's sort of like taking that same idea of rapidly shifting gears between tempos and applying that to the gent sound. With the biggest names here being two sister bands from Sweden, Viljarda and Humanity's Last Breath. And again, it's all about contrast. Contrast between the chugs and those like glitchy whammy parts, between quiet and loud, between like busy tremolo pick parts and these really slow open parts and going between like sludgy and blast beats in a really unpredictable way. And the reason why this works is something that's common to pretty much all forms of art, which is contrast. Contrast is another word for dynamics, which is one of the most important ingredients in art of all kinds. For example, if you look at a painter like Mondrian, it's all about the dynamics between these big solid areas in the negative space, these thin lines against thick ones, really bright, bold colors that contrast against each other. And the same idea applies to music. Like when Deathcore would put those big chunky breakdowns next to a blasting death metal part and it just melted everyone's brain with how heavy it was. Because loud parts feel more intense when they're next to a quiet part. Fast parts feel faster when they're next to a slow part. That is why this stuff works and why it's so heavy. And although I'm not personally a fan of the genre, I think you could throw melodic death metal in here as well. For example, At The Gates. Oh. Again, it's that mix of opposites, of melody and aggression that creates this really interesting tension, almost like sweet and sour in food. And I think you could argue that is heavier than just like straight up brutality, because again, it creates this more complex, nuanced emotional response in most people than tremolo riffs and blast beats ever will. Another interesting conception of heaviness would be aggression, and in particular, like the idea of rawness and a lack of polish. Because one of the big criticisms of thrash metal and then death metal in the 90s was that it had gotten too slick and polished and killed the energy that made death metal exciting in the first place. And this became a especially true when everyone started going to the same studio, a place called Morris Sound Studios in Tampa, Florida, where they would literally use the same gear with the same settings as the other band that came in there. Like they just had drums and amps set up. Everyone would use the same thing. And it really did start to sound the same. It didn't sound bad necessarily, but it did sound the same, became like very predictable. Like if you're around back then, back in 1993, how many bands did you hear like every week that sounded exactly like this? And 
And so in reaction to that, some people came along who said, fuck this, let's make metal raw and threatening and nasty again. For example, the second wave black metal scene with Emperor, Mayhem, Dark Throne, and all those other bands. As most of us know at this point, this stuff was deliberately loose and grimy with these like filthy lo-fi recordings that sounded like absolute shit. Like, I can't remember who it was, but I remember one of those bands saying how they recorded the vocals by screaming into a pair of headphones rather than a microphone, so it would sound extra shitty. And if you've watched my other videos, you'll know that I'm not really a big fan of black metal for the most part. But even so, I totally respect what those second wave bands were going for. I remember all that stuff coming out in the mid-90s, and it was extremely fresh and shocking. It was exactly what the scene needed at the time. And around the same time, there was also a wave of hardcore bands doing the same thing, like saying, fuck all this like polished, high production, metallic stuff that's getting popular in the scene, like Earth Crisis and all that kind of stuff. Let's just go back to the basics of playing just like fast, pissed off, raw, hardcore. For example, Spaz, Despise You, Capitalist Casualties, Rest in Peace, Spider Mike, and my personal favorite band of the genre, No Comment. <laughs> Another example of this more recently would be all the bands that I like to call the new school, old school death metal bands like Frozen Soul, Sanguasugabog, I think that's how you say it, and my personal favorites, Gate Creeper, who are all bringing back that like raw, nasty, filthy 1990s style of death metal. And for me personally, all this stuff is way heavier than other bands that might be like faster and tighter, but are just missing that like raw aggression that drew me to death metal in the first place. It's not 100% true 100% of the time, but I think in general, emotion is what makes something heavy. Like how does it make you feel? And for the most part, when you're in the studio redoing a part 50 times to get it just absolutely perfect, note for note, so it lines up on the grid, generally speaking, that is gonna kill the emotion. And to me, that makes the music kind of not heavy no matter how fast it is. One specific more recent trend that I think is kind of interesting is what I like to call the Deathcore Vocal Olympics. And and basically what I mean by this is that most of the big breakout bands in the genre of the past few years all have one thing in common, which is that they're taking vocals to places that nobody would have ever thought of or maybe even thought was possible as little as 10 years ago. For example, Alex Terrible from Slaughter to Prevail and maybe more than anyone else, Will Ramos from Lorna Shore. <laughs> And I'm calling this trend out specifically because I think there's something kind of uniquely compelling about the human voice. Because not everybody plays guitar or drums, but everybody has a voice. So when you hear people doing stuff like that with their vocals, even to the casual listener that knows nothing about like music production, you're just like, how in the fuck is he making that sound come out of his mouth? Like, how is this even humanly possible? Like, we intuitively know that it's a human making that sound, so it almost feels kind of like alien when you hear it. And because of that, these kind of vocals have a kind of shock value that you're just never gonna get with drums or guitar. And is shock value the same thing as heavy? Well, no, but kinda, sorta. I definitely think there's some sort of overlap there. So it's at least worth a mention, I think. And so far, we have mostly focused on the sound and production, but personally, for me, maybe the biggest factor in what makes something heavy as far as like, it makes me feel something, creates that emotional response that I talked about, for me, it's it's the lyrics and imagery. To me, the classic example here is Alice in Chains' album Godsmack, especially the title track. For those who may not know, smack is a slang term for heroin that was popular back in the 80s and 90s. And so this song, and really like the album as a whole, is about how heroin has kind of become his god. Like the chorus is, what in God's name have you done? Stick your arm for some real fun. And then there's this line, which is basically him realizing that he has destroyed his life with his addiction. And
And, you know, on one hand, on a purely musical basis, maybe this isn't as brutal as Dying Fetus or Nile or whatever. But to me, this is way, way heavier because it's not about a mummy or some other like imaginary stuff out of a comic book or a monster movie or a D&D &D manual. It's about something that is unfortunately way too real. My stepsister died of an opioid overdose. My dad used to be a junkie, like three or four of my uncles have all done time because of heroin. Like this is real shit. And confronting that, to me, that is heavy. Life of Agony is another good example here to me, especially their album Ugly from 1995. For those who may not know, their vocalist Mina, formerly known as Keith, came out as trans about 10 years ago. And knowing that, when you listen to the just like pain and anguish in these lyrics, it just hits so hard. I mean, like, even just think of the name of this album, Ugly. I don't know. I'm not, you know, putting words in Mina's mouth. But to me, the obvious sort of subtext is that she felt ugly looking in the mirror her whole life because she felt like she was supposed to be seeing someone else in the mirror. I don't know what that's like, but I would guess it's extremely difficult. And again, to me, that is way heavier than some, like, comic book space mummy shit. Linkin Park's song, One More Light, is another example of that. Like, that song is so heavy lyrically that it's almost hard for me to listen to, especially knowing what Chester was going through at the time. Or as a really extreme example of that, this pop song called Numb Little Bug that you may have heard, which on the surface sounds like something they would play in the Macy's Junior section. But if you actually listen to the lyrics, they're some of the most bleak, hopeless, brutal lyrics about depression that I have ever heard. Do you ever get a little bit tired of life like you're not? Like, those lyrics are not far off from, like, I hate God. It is some seriously deep, dark, intense shit. And to me, that is heavier than 99% of death metal. All right, my friends, that does it for this video. As always, let me know what you think in the comments, what makes a band heavy to you, and what bands would be the best examples of that. Also, check me out on Twitch if you haven't. There's a link to that in the description of this video. And as always, I want to thank everyone who supports me on Patreon, especially those of you who support at the True Cult level or above. Patrons get every podcast a week early. I do giveaways. There's also a way to have me review your music. Every month, I do a call for submissions. If you want me to check something out and review it live on Twitch, all you got to do is drop it in the comments of that post. Then I put it on Patreon for everyone to see. So if that sounds cool to you, check it out at the link in the description of this video. And with that, I'm going to sign off for now, but I will see you next time.